So I've got the huge pleasure of introducing our next section of, of um, presentations, which focus upon national and international perspectives um, on childhood well-being and resilience. And Caroline Lewis is going to start us off from the University of South Wales, talking about a developing a resilient nation, devolution and the Welsh approach to enhancing well-being. So welcome, Caroline. We're really looking forward to your presentation. Hi, thank you, and uh, really enjoy, really glad to be here today. Um, OK, so I'm just waiting for my PowerPoint to load one second. Can I just confirm everybody can see that? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. try just speaking forward once and back again and see if we can all <laughs> <laughs> just to make sure? OK, yeah. yeah, we can see it. We can see it. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, lovely. Thank you. OK, so um, as I said, I'm Caroline Lewis. I work at the University of Wales Trinity St David in Swansea. Um, so I'm just going to keep the camera off if that's OK with everybody, purely because I think that tends to help with connectivity. And obviously, if there are any questions later, I'll switch it back on. And I will apologise in advance for any dog related interruptions. I'm sorry. Um, but in terms of the chapter that I've looked at, my concern is with regards to the Welsh approach to enhancing well-being and this notion of how what Welsh government have aimed to do in terms of this notion of resilience is really take this idea of well-being and apply in it in a very broad context across a range of policy areas, particularly with regards to how that then impacts on young children and life chances. So I'd just like to give you you a quick talk through my chapter and particularly in the first instance some of the background really within Wales. So in terms of the country we have a number of challenges um, as you can see on the left hand side what you have there is just a diagram really that illustrates the population density of Wales and that in itself often causes a huge problem. Um, in terms of a very dispersed population, as you can see, there are heavy concentrations in the south and the southwest and again up in the uh, northeast. And the majority of the country tends to be very rural. So we are the smallest of the mainland UK nations. We have a population of 3.138 million as of the last count. And that as well leads to a number of social problems. We do have a particular challenge when it comes to the legacy of the mining era, for example. So anybody that knows a little bit of Welsh history will know that we have a heavy reliance, or we had a heavy reliance on the mining industry, particularly in the South Wales Valleys. Now, it's something that I do have a particular affinity for in terms of the history. I'm from there myself. Um, which if the accent doesn't give it away, apparently it does by the end of the day. I get more Welsh as the day goes on, or so I'm told. Um, but that has created quite a lot of issues um, with the fact that there has been very little investment in terms of the Welsh economy, some have seen, following the collapse of the mining industry and what that has meant for the various regions affected. You've also got other issues with heavy reliance, for example, in Patalbot on the steel industry, which is frequently in the news, um, heavy concentration on agriculture in certain parts of the country, the coastal areas relying on tourism, and so on and so forth. So they create a number of challenges and a number of problems for the population and how we deal with this. That then impacts on various other aspects such as um, transport, for example, and communications and creates a quite a unique situation that Wales has in this sense. So what I would just like to sort of focus on very briefly is what this has meant in terms of devolution. So in 1997, for anybody who may be unfamiliar, there was a referendum following the election which returned a vote of 50.3% in favour of devolution. And what this meant was there was the agreement to devolve certain powers from Westminster to what would be the National Assembly for Wales in a number of areas. And this was generally considered to be a favourable outcome from the point of view that the consensus was that there were certain decisions that were being made in Westminster that were not representative of the views of the Welsh people and did not necessarily take into account the particular challenges that Wales had. 
So when the National Assembly for Wales was opened, it was opened in Cardiff Bay in 1999, there was secondary legislative powers granted in a number of areas. Now, this included education. It's important to note that these were secondary legislative powers at this particular time. So it did mean that we were not able to formulate acts of government, but we were able to determine how they were then interpreted within the Welsh context. Following that, there was full primary legislative powers granted in 2011, which was the result of a further referendum at the time, and great, greater powers were then extended to the Welsh Assembly government. So quite a few developments in a short period of time then, and we officially renamed the Welsh Assembly government as the Welsh government in 2014. And if anybody's interested in that, what that effectively means is there was a differentiation then between the different legislative arms of Welsh government and what they did. So in terms of what this means for us then, in relation to the ambitions that Welsh government had, well, they were quite sort of strategic really. Um, this notion of poverty and well-being within Wales has something which has been researched and looked at for some particular time. And there have been very well-established links between poverty, mental health and well-being. A lot of research has taken place, particularly in Valleys communities, particularly looking at the impact that poverty has had on resilience, looking at this notion of how young people in particular are at significant risk, and also this sense of poverty as being seen as a as a taboo area, not something that was to be discussed, not something that was to be focused on in, in any way, shape or form. And there's been research in recent years, and particularly you can see here from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, looking at the correlation between a child's socioeconomic circumstances and the attainment that they have in school. So from the point of view of Welsh Government priorities, this sense of developing a resilient nation was very important early on with the Welsh Assembly Government because they saw this as a way in which they could drive change in terms of policy development. There was a very clear acknowledgement that if we address issues that children have right from their earliest ages and surround that with support for the family and the various other organisations and institutions that are involved with them, then there was a real way to make a difference and to sort of break this very cyclical nature of poverty. There's a lot of concern that there's almost a culture of defeatism in some areas where the views of parents, grandparents and other family members will translate to children and younger people in terms of ambition and that causes then further issues in terms of well-being and so on. So we've used poverty as a real driver for change for our policy developments. Um, Welsh Government in particular are very keen in working with various third sector organisations and other key stakeholders. So you can see there that Children in Wales, for example, um, which is a charitable organisation, has conducted a significant amount of research in highlighting concerns over well-being. They release an annual report by which they survey various families and look at the concerns that have been highlighted by those families in terms of their experiences of living with poverty within Wales. So children in Wales are also responsible for overseeing the End Child Poverty Network, which I'm also a member of as well. So this is a cause that's particularly sort of close to my heart. So in terms of the various research that children in Wales have done, um, if we look at the 2015 survey, for example, 100% of respondents indicated that welfare reform was a key concern. 80% um, saw it as more of a concern since 2014, and 95% of respondents highlighted food poverty as a concern. There were also concerns over areas of debt and surveys that were conducted in 2016 through to 2018 saw no significant decrease in these concerns. But what they did note was an increase in the references to the impact of poverty on children's well-being and in particular a lack of support when it comes to trained counsellors and other support organisations within schools. So they drew upon various research which talked about adverse childhood experiences and how those relate and translate into well-being in adulthood. Um, 
the research has shown that 47% of those who were surveyed, for example, who have experienced one or more adverse childhood experience, um, and 14% had suffered four or more. And these particular childhood stresses and these encounter things such as mental illness, domestic violence, verbal abuse, and so on. These have a direct correlation then to well-being and achievement within later stages of an individual's life. So there's a very real concern from Welsh Government and the third sector organisations that they work with as to how to combat this and how to address these particular concerns. Um, moving forward then, so how did Welsh Government sort of respond to this? What was, what was the challenge? Well, at the end of the day, if you are looking at devolved responsibility and you are looking at this notion of establishing something quite meaningful in terms of Welsh Government at the start of devolution, there was a need to make a bold statement. And these particular bold statements came in the form of these two documents here. These were these initial policy documents. Now, Jane Davison, who is then the Minister for Education and Skills, she produced the foreword for each of these two documents. And we start off with the learning country in 2001. And this really built a sense of what they were going to achieve for the next 10 years within Welsh Government when it comes to sort of children and young people. So it didn't specifically mention well-being. They didn't actually define what well-being means in terms of these documents, but they do position education policy and welfare as central in terms of enabling and facilitating development. So they wanted to address education and learning in its entirety. There was an emphasis on equality and an emphasis on achievement and attainment. And this was the 10 year document that was going to enable this. In 2006, this was then followed up with Vision into Action, which was to be the follow up and progress review at this point. And at this point, we do start to see well-being coming into the language that is being used. So we start to see more specific progress on the objectives that have been set, um, a specific link between developing educational policy that has a meaningful link with the child poverty agenda. And it clarified how Welsh Government saw their role in tackling the poverty of educational opportunity and raising standards. So it, this was seen as an intrinsic document to actually addressing the issues of child poverty. And if you have a look at this particular text, it outlines how a child in Wales would have access to a range of opportunities throughout their life course to enable and facilitate their further development. Um, they took this notion of the cyclical nature of poverty even further and start, really started to develop then over the next few years a focus on societal well-being. But this acknowledgement that in order to achieve societal well-being, and don't get me wrong, we're far away from achieving that now, but it would mean a reform of the public sector in partnership with various services and this would then link to the notion of the development of a resilient nation. And a lot of this we took from the approach in Scotland, where there were very similar challenges in terms of poverty and the demographics and communities there. So some key initiatives then, and I'm not going to necessarily go through all of these, but these were just four of the initiatives that were set up by Welsh Government as part of these initial learning country documents that aimed to support not just children themselves, but also families by starting intervention programs and support programs at a very early age. So fly and start, families first, communities first, supporting people. They're all built on this notion of supporting community and supporting individuals in a wider sense. So lots more further developments occurred over the next few years with regards to this. And in particular, we have things such as the Children and Families Measure of 2010, which set out the policy to eradicate child poverty in its entirety, set up some very bold statements at the time about the formal eradication of child poverty, um, but was framed around this notion of support. Also made sure that children and young people in particular had a voice when it comes to this. 
This was then formalised through the Child Poverty Strategy for Wales in 2011, which outlined the ways in which Welsh Government can practically improve outcomes, setting objectives, reducing the number of workless households. This was then further updated in 2015. So there's been a number of different areas for development that have come through, but one of the most significant is this. The Wellbeing of Future Generations Act Wales, of 2015. Now, a landmark piece of legislation, this came about as a result of what was called a national conversation in 2014, where surveys from people across Wales were looking at answering the question of what do we want the country to look like by 2050? And it resulted in this particular piece of legislation. Now, it's the first of its kind in the world and has been commended by the United Nations and takes on board the principle of sustainable development, uh, which, as you can see, is listed on the slide there. So improving economic, social, environmental, and cultural well-being um, in accordance with the sustainable development principle. And it's built on these seven goals. So these are the seven goals of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And the idea is, is that every public body within Wales has an obligation to work towards these. And it frames it from the point of view of a child growing up in Wales today, what they will have access to, what they will have opportunities to do in order to be successful within their lives. So it's a very wide ranging, very broad particularly um, interesting piece of legislation. It's supported by our Future Generations Commissioner, who at this moment in time is Sophie Howe, and she is the person that holds the various public bodies accountable for their responses and for their ideas and their um, particular wellbeing objectives that they're required to set as part of this Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So it's something that places this legal obligation on public bodies um, and they have to think in terms of long term goals, how they're going to prevent issues arising, how they're going to work collaboratively. And it's just this notion of trying to do things differently within Wales. It's still very much at the early stages in development. It's still something that people are, are very much getting to grips with, but it does ensure that there is a focus on sustainability in the definition that we have there. So in terms of where we go from here, um, well, you may well be aware that there are a number of different issues and focuses that are coming through from the Welsh perspective. Um, we have a review of the primary and secondary curriculum following the publication of Successful Futures by Graham Donaldson, um, which looks at the revision of the curriculum. And that actually does put well-being very centrally at the notion of what we do within our schools. This was then formalised through Education Our National Mission, which talks about how the 46, 47 recommendations that Graham Donaldson highlighted in his initial report were to be accepted and implemented. This will now be translated into action via the Curriculum for Wales, which is being rolled out at the moment and is something that will be in place in all schools by I think 2026 is going to be the last section of the curriculum which is going to be fully implemented. And we've also had a reformation of the higher education funding system. So this is just a very brief sort of trot through and showing how what we have got in Wales is a very unique approach when it comes to well-being um, and looking at this idea of supporting individuals, supporting families, supporting children to become resilient by reforming as much of the public sector as we can to ensure that there is a fully supportive system in place that will help develop and will help support learners, young people and children throughout their lives really. So I think I'm probably pretty much out of time now. Um, thank you very much for listening. Do is. Is there, are there any questions or is there anything that anybody would like to, to raise? Caroline, is it OK that we can do the questions at the end if that's do all the, right? Yeah, of course, of okay. course. Yeah, Thank that's you. absolutely fine. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Caroline. As you know, Caroline and I are kindred spirits because we um, have lots of here I for the homeland with me living in England when I came from Wales. So we've had lots of discussions in the course of writing this book around um, the Welsh policy and, and how things are very different. So I really love that. Thank you so much, Caroline. It's absolutely lovely. I'm moving on um, now because we have a little bit of a continental aspect um, with can delegates from the University of Milan. So I'm really thrilled to introduce Elisabetta Biffi, Cristiana Palmieri and Maria Benedetta Gambacorti Passerini, who are going to talk to us about challenging the role of educational professionals in supporting children in Italian schools. Welcome. Thank Hi, you. welcome. So thank you for so much. I'm Elisabetta Biffi. I'm going to introduce the, uh, the presentation and then I will leave the stage to my colleague um, uh, Maria Benedetta Gambacorti, who is going to go ahead with the presentation. Um, okay. and just a little quick check for the slides. Who is going to run out? Run on yeah, I, I'm, try, I'm trying, but uh, I can't. Uh, I don't understand why. We can see it when you when you when you put it on the screen. We can see it then, and then it goes away. So we can see it now. Now you are seeing it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So we are going to start with the presentation. Our chapter is about well-being as a right. We try to stress how well-being is part of the rights of the child in a very broad sense. And we try to explore how this is strictly connected with the um, educational uh, professionals uh, training and how professionals can support the children in developing uh, and ensuring their uh, well-being. Uh, throughout all the educational settings. So going ahead, next step, slide, please. This one, the next, the next, next one, step. please. Thank you. So we are a group of uh, three uh, professors. I'm so sorry, um, so sorry to disturb you. We, the, the slide is frozen at the moment. Um, it's not on the actual slideshow. Um, is, that, okay. sorry, is that what you're seeing too? I'm, I'm was, I was speaking to the second slide. Yeah, we're not seeing the second slide. We're still seeing your title slide, but it's not on the slideshow presentation. It's on the, the screen that we'd see before that. So we, we can see your slides down the left hand side. Okay. Um, uh, so, so Benedetta, can you try to um, put, put on the second slide? Okay, this is the second slide. I'm seeing the second slide. We are not, we are just, we are going, seeing only the first one. Uh, okay, uh, I don't know. Put on the second one and then do the same. Now you're seeing it. Let's see. Yes, that's great. Thank Perfect. you. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's all technical problems. Thank, sorry for that. So going ahead, the well-being can be considered as a part of the fundamental, um, is it considered as a, a fundamental part of the best interest of the child, which is um, stressed so much in all the convention uh, since the UNCRC and throughout all the um, international strategies for supporting and protecting children. And as we can, we all know uh, what has to be considered as best interest of the child is a challenge throughout all the commissions and uh, there is a specific um, uh, attention put on the um, commission of the child of the rights at the UN uh, for this, trying to define we can be how we can describe this best interest and how we can um, yeah um, ensure the uh, respect of this best interest throughout all the um, settings for, of the children's lives. And what we uh, can describe is that at the end, the best interest is um, has to be uh, considered as what is strictly important based on the uh, on the point of view of the child of the child him or herself in these terms it's really important what the child can what the child thinks and uh, feels within his or her experience uh, this 
means that um, within the Convention of the Right of the Child, we will see that the best interest of the child is the primary goal of, to every action related to the children and is a specific duty to all state parties to undertake it and um, ensuring the child such as protection and care as is part of their um, his or her well-being in a very broad sense. So next slide, please. Do you see it? Yes, thank yes. you. So a child's well-being is related to his or her physical development, of course, but it's also related to what is the general environment where the child is growing and is calling um, a specific uh, um, is need, is a, is a, it needs a specific aspect, all different specific aspects related to his or her life in terms of which is um, the uh, capacity of the adults around him or her to um, uh, yeah, respect his or her dignity, to respect his or her feelings and so on. So at the end, um, what is really important is to start from the adults in order to ensure the well-being of children. This is particularly important when we um, are talking about the educational professionals. As we have to consider that a lot of time, really in a very uh, familiar situation, we will see that children spend a lot of time during the day with, uh, within educational services, more than somehow and in some situation, the time that they spent within their families. So uh, if, if we consider that, it's so important to stress the um, professional uh, competencies of um, educators and teachers and the social workers and all the ones who are working with children in order to be aware of what uh, a well-being means for child and to be aware to uh, respect this and uh, to cope with uh, the challenge of, of um, ensuring this well-being throughout all the daily uh, activities uh, uh, in which children are involved within the services. So with the, in this sense, it is important to understand the complexity of the child as the best interest of the child is at the end um, required at the end to focus on the specific situation of the child, the specific, um, uh, the, the specific uh, life at the end of the child by his or her self. And it's not a theoretical um, idea. It had not to be just a theoretical or a, uh, idea, but it has to be a practical uh, way, pr a pra practical way of uh, through which we can um, provide the educational and uh, um, the educational yeah, um, uh, activities. So uh, this is the general um, framework, and then I'm going to pass the, and leave the stage to Benedetta for the practical. Um, uh, impact of this general framework. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elisabetta. I'm going on. And uh, so, uh, within uh, this framework, uh, our contribution in the book is focused uh, on, uh, on school in the Italian context and especially uh, about uh, special educational needs in schools. Uh, so we have to specify that the term uh, special educational needs uh, was proposed uh, some years ago and uh, it covers all the difficulties that children could develop in their schooling uh, experience and it is based on a specific uh, international classification on functioning disability and health. Uh, the Italian system particularly has considered a re-evaluation of the core duties of special needs teachers uh, in order to create good practices uh, uh, for inclusion and well-being of every child uh, in school. Uh, in this sense, uh, the, the specific effort uh, is focused on a rethinking uh, of the role uh, both of special needs teacher and both of the curricular teachers uh, uh, trying to produce uh, um, 
well-structured and specific didactic tools, uh, creating the conditions for uh, an individual and unique learning processes for every student. Uh, in this sense, uh, the, uh, the aim is to create uh, a learning context uh, able to address every student's uh, needs, uh, more or less uh, special uh, these needs are. And all these aspects uh, in Italy are um, specific supported by a political and legislative legitimacy and by a curricular and special needs uh, teachers trainings uh, that create uh, uh, individual dispositions and competencies to work uh, in uh, an inclusive way. Uh, so, uh, this uh, uh, general framework has some uh, um, particular points of attention. First of all, the didactic system implies uh, the chance to create a personalized educational path for children with special educational needs. In this sense, uh, uh, this aim requests the setting up not only of individualized teaching processes, but uh, uh, also general learning processes able to modify uh, the scholastic context uh, and in this sense uh, to support everyone's educational process. Uh, there is also a, a specific uh, instrument uh, in Italian school uh, that is called uh, the didactic personalized plan. And this plan supports teachers and all the educational professionals in this direction. In this sense, it involves uh, teachers, health services, uh, and also children's families in its definition. And it is particularly focused both on knowing the children's characteristics and needs and both on identifying the material and immaterial elements of the context that must change in order to enhance accessible learning experience for every child. Uh, in this sense, the Italian system also foresees uh, uh, a, a specific uh, working group for inclusion in every school. And this working group has a specific task that you can see in the slide. So the notification of special educational needs, the collection of the documentation, uh, supporting and discussing with colleagues about working with special educational needs, uh, a, uh, monitoring actions of the level of inclusion of the school, and the proposal of an annual plan for inclusion and evaluation of the activities. So, uh, as we are uh, uh, now saying, the attention in Italian scholastic system is oriented to strengthen the children's capabilities to cope with their special educational needs. Uh, in this sense, uh, in our presentation and also in our contribution in the book, uh, it's important to deepen the concept of resilience and recovery that are um, for us fundamental to ve de develop an inclusive way of schooling. So uh, we intend, and the Italian system intend the resilience as, as uh, uh, the competence of bouncing back in the face of adversity. And uh, uh, the term re recovery, uh, mutued from the area of mental health and well-being, uh, as a personal process that implies uh, a changing movement uh, mm, that accompanies the person to a new adjustment for his or her life. In this sense, uh, every experience, uh, also experiencing uh, special educational needs, uh, can bring uh, a uh, generative changing process uh, that can produce uh, learning, self-knowledge, uh, awareness about possible existential conditions. Uh, in this sense, a child's early self-awareness relating to his or her well-being can promote uh, a changing process through a shared re-elaboration of experience. In this sense, uh, educational professionals' role and practice is fundamental and pivotal in doing this. So, 
uh, which is uh, which can be the role of educational professionals in supporting children's well-being in Italian schools. First of all, educational professionals are asked to create the conditions through which children and adults can discover also uh, both their limits and both their potentialities through lived educational experience that put to the test their well-being in protected context. Uh, we use uh, the expression put to the test because it means that uh, educational experience uh, uh, can be a challenging experience. Uh, in this sense, it, it's not uh, a well-being experience in itself, but education is intended as an experience that allows children and adults to identify and understand their personal and their relational resources, uh, to be more aware of their weakness and capabilities, and also to be able to ask for help when it is necessary. So planning such situations requires the educator to take into account both the material and in material dimensions that compose it. So we intend spaces, times, objects, rituals, languages, roles, rules, symbols, gestures, postures, and etc. All the dimensions that compose the experience in school. So Focusing on special educational need of children in Italian schools as uh, uh, three points uh, of attention that we um, deepen in our contribution. First of all, teachers and uh, in a more general way, educational professionals must be able to create material and organizational conditions in order to support an inclusive way of making school. Then they must change their way of teaching in order to promote learning by experience, identifying the most adequate practices and activities for the different ways of children's learning and being at school. And uh, as a third point of attention, they must enhance the children's capabilities to feel, manifest, think about and process what they live inside and outside the school. So uh, going uh, to a conclusion of our contribution, we can say that uh, the Italian effort is to create a school that can be uh, a positive experience, a positive opportunity for everyone a place where all uh, the children, the students can experience, recognize uh, and know how to face their educational needs, less or more special uh, they are. These are uh, some of the references uh, we used uh, uh, in the chapter. And uh, now we can say thank you all for your attention and for every question you want. Thank you so much to you both, um, Elisabetta and Benedetta. Uh, really lovely. And I'm sure we're all sat here trying to think, oh, what's similar to the schools in the UK and what's different? And I think this is a theme which will carry on as we go throughout the day as well. Um, so we're going to move directly on to our next presentation and then we will take questions from all three okay. of the, of the um, presentations we've had in our international slot together, if that's OK. Thank you again. It was really lovely, really lovely of you. So our next pre presentation focuses upon the role of the kindergarten in children's well-being and resilience within Norway, which I hope will be lovely for us. So I'm really thrilled to welcome Maria Dardanu and Irene Gamst Nergard from the Arctic University of Norway to present on their book chapter uh, around the early years in Norway. Hello uh, from us, uh, from uh, the north. <laughs> uh, it was uh, nice to um, uh, be here in this uh, wonderful uh, book seminar that we, you have uh, planned. My name is Maria Dardano and I am an um, associate professor at, of the pedagogy at the Early Childhood Teacher Education at the University of Tromsø. Yes, and I'm Erin Damsnagard and I 
uh, work as an assistant professor together with Maria, and I also teach pedagogy in the early childhood teachers program. Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, so in our chapter, we will uh, discuss the various terms and arguments in policy documents relating to children's well-being and resilience in the context of the Norwegian kindergarten. Uh, we hope to share with you the, uh, the role of the policy documents and the kindergarten practices in promoting uh, children's well-being and resilience. So the Norwegian context and welfare system. First, I'd like to give you some contextual information about Scandinavia and in Norway, about Norway in particular. Uh, Maria and I, we are blessed to live in Scandinavia and in a country with a welfare system that provides social care from birth and throughout our whole lives. Uh, the oil and fish have made Norway into a rich country and the government has for decades invested this money in a welfare system supporting children's family and school and education system. So to start with when a child is born, the parents get to stay at home in turns with the child for between 49 or 59 weeks. And the parental leave benefits allows the parents to stay at home for 49 weeks of full earnings. And if you want to expand the parental leave for up to 59 weeks, the earning is reduced to 80% of your income. And 15 weeks of of these uh, 49 or um, uh, 49 weeks uh, of the maternity leave is reserved for the father only. And so 15 weeks is also ex exclusively for the mother. And usually the mother stays at home the first 15 weeks due to natural reasons as nursing and, and so on. Uh, but for the remaining 19 or 21 weeks, it is up to the parents to decide who gets to stay at home. Um, with this generous maternity leave, the government states the importance of the parents to bond and develop attachment with their child. It allows parents to take care of their, chil their child during its first year without having to worry about the financial situation. And the way minimum 15 weeks are for the father only, the government states the importance of both parents to bond with the child. And the father's part in parenting is of equal importance as the mother's. So the welfare system also supports the kindergarten financially. And with that in mind, you can view the kindergarten as part of a flexible welfare system in Norway. For example, the maximum cost of a full time attending in a Norwegian kindergarten is set to about 270 pounds of a month. Uh, the rest of the cost is in running a kindergarten is supported by the government. And it's equal if it's a, a community or it's a private um, uh, kindergarten. So the children attend kindergarten between the age of one and until they start school the year they turn six. Uh, we will uh, provide now some uh, more information about the Norwegian uh, kindergarten. As Aileen uh, mentioned, um, in the Norwegian kindergarten attend uh, children aged between one and five year old. The Norwegian kindergarten is not mandatory for children, but almost 92% of the Norwegian children attend the kindergarten. Uh, and they are usually uh, those children uh, divided into mixed uh, age groups. The Norwegian kindergarten uh, aims to promote children's creativity, sense of wonder and search of knowledge, and is based on values such as democracy, respect and inclusion. Uh, the kindergarten staff uh, must ensure that all children find a safety, belongingness uh, and well-being in the Norwegian kindergarten. And the framework is uh, distinguished in between uh, seven interdisciplinary areas of learning. It is also important to uh, underline here that uh, in Norway we have an indigenous group, the Sami people, which are around, uh, they live around 100,000 Sami uh, people in Norway uh, now. The Norwegian framework for kindergarten refers to the importance of including the Sami culture and language in the kindergarten practices.
Um, the Norwegian uh, framework for kindergarten has uh, the uh, UN's convention as a founding starting point. Kindergartens uh, shall and must recognize children's right to participation. Therefore, in the Norwegian framework for kindergarten is underlined the importance of children participation uh, in accordance to their age and their premises. A Norwegian study uh, made by Selen and Sandesetter from 2015 indicates a strong correlation between uh, experiencing happiness and well-being to first to three year old uh, children when they are participating to social interactions with others as opposed to being deeply concentrated in play and exploration. A holistic approach to learning is an expression used uh, to distinguish between the pedagogical perspectives for formulated in the Norwegian framework for kindergartens. The framework uh, differentiates between care, uh, formation, play, knowledge, social competence, communication and language, and it should be understood in the context as the kindergarten's contribution to children's holistic development. <clears throat> So well-being as a concept in Norway. The concept of well-being has been accurately introduced earlier today, so I will focus on well-being as a concept in Norwegian kindergartens. Uh, framework for the kindergarten underlines that kindergartens shall promote physical and mental health in the children. They shall contribute to the children's well-being, happiness, attainment and feeling of self-worth and they shall combat harassment and bullying. This is from the framework. Um, uh, yeah, so the kindergarten teachers are advised to adhere strictly to the framework and the education programs for early childhood education emphasize the content of the framework during in their uh, in their studying programs. So the goal is to present well-being as a concept in the kindergarten's programs and to educate, educate students to become teachers who are aware of well-being and its content. And I'll move on to resilience in Norwegian kindergartens. And as it goes for as with well-being, the concept of resilience has also been introduced earlier today and it was really exciting to to hear about it. So I will not enter resilient as a concept, but I will try to present how resilience in, is provided for within the Norwegian kindergartens. And again, the framework for Norwegian kindergartens emphasizes the importance of providing for every child's outcome in terms of both social and cognitive development. As Maria said, the children in Norwegian kindergartens are encouraged to participate in their daily activities. Within the opening hours in kindergarten, the teachers facilitate for the children to play with peers. Free playtime has a high status in the kindergarten programs and it allows the children to develop their social skills. The framework states that the children must experience a variety of both success and failure in order to cope and regulate their own emotions. And by supervising and supporting children's play and social interaction and interactions, the kindergarten teachers provide time and help to initiate play activities that can enhance children's emotional and social development. Developing social competence is emphasized as important for children in Norwegian kindergartens. Focusing on a child's social and emotional development can result in resilient adaptation and behavior. That's the aim or the idea. So the kindergartens can therefore reduce social differences in at least two ways. One, due to the government's financial support, the parents' income doesn't prevent the family to afford to send their child to kindergarten. And the other issue is that all kindergartens must adhere the contents of the framework and by providing for a variety of activities children who attend kindergarten are not depending on where they live nor the family's income alone in order to thrive and develop so for children who experience maltreatment 
Kinderca kindergarten can be of importance functioning as an environment providing both resilience and well-being. A positive teacher-child relation can enhance a child's social well-being and resilience because having close ties with one adult can function as the significant other and therefore provide resilience and well-being. Uh, so principles in the Norwegian kindergarten enc encourage, as we mentioned, values such as uh, learning, democratic ideas and solidarity through children's active participation in kindergarten's everyday activities. The focus is on children's experience that facilitate those social interactions and expose children in responsibilities and independence. Being a part of a group and uh, uh, can acknowledge the contribution of each other, which is necessary and vital for the whole group's enjoyment, play and having a good time. Through participating in a variety of activities, spontaneous and planned, Children have opportunities to experience a sense of inclusion, belonging and, and promoting of auto autonomy. Therefore, their invo involvement in indoor and outdoor activities provides sensory experiences, social interactions in the sense of freedom in open spaces. The Norwegian kindergarten, as uh, I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, as also the Norwegian culture is in general uh, influenced by the Sami culture, where nature is a resource for different aspects of everyday life. Uh, and as the uh, framework is uh, underlined, the kindergarten should build on a Sami understanding of nature and Sami culture. So well-being also includes understanding about the influence of one's environment and experiences. So teaching children to influence their everyday life in kindergarten through their interaction with other children can provide children with a feeling of a self value. And that is also a vital starting point for active participation in one's culture and social community. Uh, in our chapter also, we provide an example of uh, children's active participation and responsibilities that uh, can emerge from uh, planning a trip in a nearby uh, forest. So what can we conclude from this presentation or from our chapter? Um, playful activities have intrinsic value for children and it is through such experience children meet with inclusiveness in social relations and practices. As we have discussed earlier uh, or the other presentations have, uh, have shown, it is difficult to measure well-being and resilience in a family level. However, almost 92% of the Norwegian children attend kindergarten and have therefore opportunities to experience the same or similar, similar practices that enhance the concepts of well-being and resilience. The kindergarten emphasizes for adults and attending children to experience an environment that promotes challenging indoor and outdoor activities. An inclusive, an inclusive community that allows the child to experience joy and happiness or and to unfold his or her's potential and to express his or her's view on the ongoing activities places kindergarten as an essential setting in young children's life. Uh, here are some uh, of the references and um, we thank you very much for the opportunity to be a part of this uh, book. Thank you thank both you. so much. It's just so interesting hearing different perspectives and different policies. And I'm sure we're all sat here thinking, gosh, you know, if this happened in the UK, I wonder how different childhood would be, wonder what the influence upon resilience and well-being would be of these changes within the early years. So absolutely lovely. Anyway, it's not for me to talk about this. It's for everybody else too. We've got a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, the first one is, and forgive me, I think it's Dion Lee. I think that's correct. If it's Lee Dion, I apologise. I just can't sort of grasp it from the way it's presented to me. And that's my question is mainly for Caroline but I would greatly appreciate any input from others. Within the Welsh Health and Wellbeing um, AOLE, do you believe our teachers are prepared to tackle the variety of problems mentioned through the, through the curriculum without being subject specialists? Do you see health and wellbeing sitting well together? 
down. Lydia, do you have your hand up to respond to this? I was going to ask a question actually from the last one, but I was uh, for, to the last two presenters, but I was in the middle of typing a response to that earlier as well. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean that that's been a made one of the main sort of um, well, a major point of critique, hasn't it, in relation to this new this uh, green paper and the whole sort of issue of well, is that just sort of loading even more onto teachers because uh, you know who are already overburdened? Um, so I, I mean, I think. Uh, a lot of the thinking is that actually it's more to do with the, you know, the educational ethos and um, environment, the school environment, uh, uh, pro probably, um, well, often considered to be a better sort of focus if one is thinking about how to enhance well-being in schools. Um, but the curriculum, obviously, also, but not necessarily in terms of actually having sort of explicit content on well-being and mental health. I mean, that's the point, isn't it? You know, I mean, and I noticed one of the uh, points of debate that, 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 that with the select committee that critiqued uh, the Green Paper and it said it was a lost chat, failing a generation, a lost chance or something it was called. One of the points was in relation to the curriculum and, and how the sort of current curriculum in I think it was talking about secondary school in particular um, kind of creates well-being problems in a way because it's quite restricted and there's a focus on these particular which I think called EBAC um, subjects relating to the English baccalaureate but um, and that the, the, in the consultation children and young people were talking about there needs to be a sort of higher priority on creative subjects for example. Um, so no, I don't think teachers are well placed to be sort of explicitly addressing well-being and particularly not mental health. I mean, but then we've got these new um, education, um, what they called mental health workers now being trained. And uh, again, there's been a lot of criticism about the curriculum for their um, training because some of it is again focused on cognitive behavioural approaches, which have been widely critiqued in relation to these sort of, you know, interventions in schools which are variously framed in relation to well-being or resilience and you know it's again it's this kind of psycho-behavioral sort of approach rather than looking more at the environment the ethos um and the you know yeah you might want to look at the curriculum but in a general sense not necessarily actually sort of teaching about mental health kind of a thing thank you lydia i can see that caroline's also responded mm -hmm. um and she's saying, I think it's certainly a challenge in relation to health and well-being, but we're seeing a change in terms of teacher training programmes to reflect the new curriculum. So, so we're moving forward and a much higher focus on well-being with that, within that. We have to be careful how much we're expecting of our teachers, um, not seeing them as solving all problems within an educational setting. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. We've also had, um, I'm just going to take them in order if that's OK, Lydia. We've also had another question, um, which I'm just trying to bring up from Carl. Um, and Carl saying, I would ask this again for all the presenters on this topic of well-being. What is your take on the shift in responsibilities from the family's primary role in the children's well-being and more a domestic, political, even a global approach to meet a child's well-being? So sort of linking on from the last question, really. Anybody like to make a response to that, either in the chat box or in person? Yes, Caroline, thank you. Sorry, everything was just freezing there for a second for me. Um, I think it's important that well, particularly what we've seen in terms of the Welsh context, and whilst I don't think anybody is saying that it isn't the case that the primary responsibility sits with families and those sorts of supporting institutions, but it's about ensuring that what we have around children and families are those additional support mechanisms in place for them to be able to support the well-being of children and young people in that context. So it's I don't think it's so much as a shift in responsibility as such, but I think it's more of a diffusion of responsibilities and, and an acknowledgement if we go back to those sorts of traditional sayings that we have, you know, it takes a community to raise a child. And I think it's that acknowledgement that if we want families and if we want parents to be able to do the best that they can, we have to have a system in place that supports that as much as possible, um, which I think is the approach that Welsh Government are, are looking to take in that sense by introducing many of these various um, support mechanisms and systems that we already have. It's going to it's going to take a while to change this this, but I think that I think that's the important thing from my point of view is that we have those that diffused responsibility rather than necessarily an, an entire shift. I think we've got to be careful of 
taking any context like that and saying that we are we are shifting responsibility in a, in a wholesale way, if that makes sense. Sorry, I'm, I was muted. It does indeed. That's lovely. Thank you. And Benedetta has responded in the chat box as well, trying to answer to Carl. Our contribution shows the Italian effort to share responsibilities between families and schools in respect of that. So um, partnership is key, says Caroline. Yes. And Lydia, you have a question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, yeah, the, with the with the uh, the last presentation there, I'm sorry, I've already forgotten <laughs> everybody's names, but uh, yeah, the on the Norwegian context, um, very interesting. Oh, Maria, that's it. Um, yeah, that, it, it, it was very interesting uh, talking about the, the the role of being children playing that sort of active role in a way. I think that was one of the points that I raised as well about that. That has been one of the points of critique within our you know work on resilience in this country as well as about it needs to be about sort of agency development um, and that actually you can end up with problems because children are constrained really in a sense by the school environment at the same time as they're being sort of asked to maybe be more sort of agentic in certain respects you know so they end up in this kind of contradictory position but um um interesting thinking about this in the context of kindergarten what i was wondering was uh, i mean the, the scandinavian context is often considered very progressive from a gender equality perspective although um i think most feminists would probably say that we, we still haven't arrived as it were even in <laughs> countries like finland and norway you know there are still a lot of problems but you know you were sort of highlighting that in a way in relation to policies on parental leave as well and how more progressive um but is there any focus on gender in the framework you were mentioning for workers because um you know, I've noticed this has been quite a problem in our nurseries, and it's one sort of area that some of our postgraduate um, students is taking up at the moment. That, um, you know, you were saying about free play and being active in constructing the environment. One of the things that I've noticed is how then all the kind of gender politics among the toddlers play out. And um, I've got a daughter who's now four, but, you know, I think she was finding it I think the problem that can come in, can't it? Can the, the children can then find it more stressful. I think she actually now, having gone to school in this country, mm -hmm. is finding it less stressful because it's more structured and she can go in there and sit at the table and, you know, and not have to sort of, you know, deal with the, you know, in, in particular the boys, it seems to me, that she's kind of reporting on, you know. And I noticed when you see the free play among the young children, and not only do the power relations play out in the things like the use of space mm. and the boys kind of whizzing. I remember, you know, I've seen, you know, whizzing around on these cars and everything you have. And then, you know, we tend to have these kind of play kitchens at the side, which is where the girls end up relegated to half the time. You know, I've seen that quite a lot. The girls are in the kitchen. You know, this is age two. The girls are in the kitchen. Boys are whizzing around, taking up the whole of the space on their play, you know, cars and what have you. Um, but, um, you know, the kind of politics, as you mentioned, bullying and so on, but it's kind of a, a bit more nuanced than that, isn't it, in relation to just how the, like you say, it kind of plays out in who's taking charge or who's being more active or whatever. But um, there are all these kind of gender relations that they're sort of negotiating and everything. I just I just wondered, is there any explicit sort of focus on that in the framework you mentioned for the for staff and for, you know, the guidance? Yeah, they're open. Okay. Oh, we have. Yeah, <laughs> you can hear us. <laughs> Thanks for the question. It's it's actually interesting that you mention it because we discussed some of our colleagues just before the weekend uh, at work here because we are allowed to to come to the office, uh, but we teach the students uh, digitally. But anyway, and and we discussed that uh, the framework uh, it mentions and that we are supposed to uh, be aware of the the gender is that was mm -hmm. yes um but i don't think we we focus enough on it even with the students when we teach them or when we educate them from the framework because we were we were discussing that we we are emphasizing uh, a lot now in in the Norwegian kindergartens and and in the education programs about well-being and and the um, uh, physical and mentally health issues, but but we don't give the the gender issue enough enough attention I think, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I can 
some of the the examples that you give, I think we would see in Norwegian kindergartens as well, mm -hmm. and especially and especially the 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 kind of um, the kind of um, toys and 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 objects the children can play with has become very very gender uh, in in terms of you have Legos and then you have one kind of Lego for the girls and then another for the boys. And earlier it used to be more mixed that you couldn't really tell. So I think uh, I think it at least my opinion or my experience is that um, that this part of the framework has lost. Um, uh, how to say it? Uh, well, we, we focus more on the well-being and the mental and physical health aspect than mm -hmm. of the gender issue. And it is quite impressive that we have um, in our teacher education for, for early childhood, we have around 30% of our students, they are, uh, they are males. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a lot of uh, male uh, future kindergarten teachers uh, mm -hmm. that are going to work with their children. I think it's probably one of the highest uh, I think in so the too. country at least. Yes, mm -hmm. in the country. And, and there, when they have when they are out in the kindergartens, because they have this practical time, they have to be out in the in the kindergarten for some weeks every year of this of their semesters, and they uh, they report back that in the kindergarten the the they are kind of being an object for this more violent play or yes. you know like the the children patients and these courses are, are yes. still there mm. about who will take this kind of uh, play and. Uh, and uh, expect from the male uh, students that they will take uh, most of the time the children out more mm. than the, the women. Yes. <laughs> so the, these discourses are still there. Mm. Yes. And especially out in the kindergartens, I think. Mm. So we would we would have to start there 